Welcome, Sultan Sud Al Qasimi. Uh, he is from the United Arab Emirates. He's a columnist for articles that have appeared in the Financial Times, The Independent, The Guardian, The Huffington Post, The New York Times, uh, Foreign Policy, Open Democracy, The Globe, and Mail, as well as many other notable publications. He is a prominent uh, commentator on Arab affairs on Twitter. Uh, currently, I think he has almost uh, half a million followers on Twitter. Uh, he had a rise in prominence during the Arab Spring when he uh, was sending out tweets that became a major uh, news source, even rivaling major news networks at the time. And Time Magazine listed him in the 140 best Twitter feeds in 2011. Uh, he is also an MIT Media Labs Director's Fellow. Uh, specifically during 2014 to 2016. And in 2014, uh, Ara Arabian business placed uh, Sultan in its list of the world's 100 most powerful Arabs under the thinkers category. Uh, he continues uh, both to write and tweet about the Arab world, both from his home in Sinjar, as well as giving lectures internationally. Sultan is also the founder of the Barjil Art Fun Foundation. Is that a correct pronunciation, Barjil? Mm -hmm. That's right. And he is in a, in, he has an independent uh, initiative uh, established to contribute to the intellectual development of the art scene in the Arab region by building a prominent and publicly accessible art collection in the United Arab Emirates. In 2017, uh, the Barjil Art Foundation will be holding exhibitions at Yale University Art Gallery uh, and the Institut de, de Monde Arabe. That's I, right. I'm, I'm terrible at French. Um, in Paris and the Jordan National Gallery of Fine Arts, amongst others. It couldn't have been something in Spanish for me to show off. Huh? <laughs> no, it had to be French, which I can't pronounce for the damn. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Sultan, for coming on. Is there anything else you wanted to add? or? No, I think that's plenty. Thank you very much, Lalo. Yeah, well, I mean, thank you for being on. And yeah, like I was saying, uh, I think you've told the story on uh, interviews that people can find online that um, it was during I, 2011 um, that you only had like 2,000 followers on Twitter and you began tweeting many things about the Arab Spring. And you were translating many speeches or movements or groups from Arabic to English. And suddenly you saw your uh, Twitter following just in start uh, incrementing following. And that became a major source for information, both for people outside the Middle East and people within. Well, that's correct. Uh, you have to put this in context. Uh, there was international interest in the region. I am not particularly interesting. But what I did was just offer a service to people, uh, very, I think, uh, largely objective. I didn't put much opinion. I was merely translating word for word. And what I had noticed, um, word, for, for, word for word, from these speeches by Hosni Mubarak, from Gaddafi, from Zain al-Abidin, and other leaders from, from the Middle East. So what I've noticed was that, uh, you know, the, the, the typical news channels were we're giving you the sound bites, maybe two or three lines at most uh, of a presidential speech, but I was translating the entire speech, and there seems to have been a lot of interest. In fact, in one of the cables that was that was leaked by WikiLeaks, there is a uh, there is a chart that uh, compares my translation with the BBC's translation, and it said that BBC stopped the translation uh, at a certain uh, hour and put out uh, a, a full report a few hours later, whereas mine continued. And they also compare the words that I chose and the words that the BBC chose. For instance, Lalo, uh, I would always translate in the first person. I believe that I am a good president for you. I believe that 
you should give me a chance, things like that from these leaders. Whereas BBC was saying things like uh, he also added that and he also uh, promised that. So I think the immediacy was um, more obvious in my translation than other news channels. That Well, that makes a very big difference. Um, before we go in too much into the social media, can you tell me a little bit more about your, your background? Sure. So I, uh, I went actually uh, to school here in, the, uh, in Sharjah, which is the third biggest emirate and the third most populous emirate in the United Arab Emirates. I went first to a, a Catholic school when I was a child, and then I went to a Lebanese school, and then I went to an international school. I graduated in 1994. Uh, I was uh, 16 years old. I was born in 1978. And I went to the American University in Paris, where I studied in the 90s. And then I came back, started a few businesses in, uh, in Dubai, in the Emirates. And then I went back and did a master's uh, in London. I am now 39 years old. And uh, what, what sparked your interest uh, during that time uh, in 2011 when you started tweeting about the the Arab Spring, what, what, dro- what drove you into to get into political discussion? So um, by 2011, I already had a few years behind me of uh, of writing about politics and about social issues. Um, you know, I, I used to write for a newspaper in, in Abu Dhabi called The National. Uh, I used to write about political issues. Uh, I, used, I read a lot. So I spend a lot of my time reading. I have a, uh, a collection of books. I have a library at home. And uh, I, uh, I was interested in Middle Eastern politics and reform. I've kept a diary, Lalo, for the past 25 years. So since I was 13 years old, I've had a diary. And uh, I write, even when I was a child, I used to write about politics and reform. And I used to be very, very uh, leftist and very uh, almost revolutionary in my thinking. You know, going over my diary now from the 90s. Uh, I'm, I mean, I haven't changed uh, too much, but I'm certainly not as uh, aggressive politically as I was, which some people consider to be a shame or a pity. Uh, so I've always been interested in politics for as far as I can remember. That was just an opportunity that came to do knocking in, in 2011. I had some free time. I decided I was watching uh, a, a speech by... Uh, by one of the leaders from the region, and I decided to translate it. And I, uh, I wasn't thinking about it because I only checked my Twitter mentions and my followers, uh, you know, towards the end of the of the speech or maybe after the speech ended. And I noticed that the number of followers had tripled, and it, I think I had about three and a half thousand. It went up to nine thousand. It was r- completely. Uh, uh, unexpected and 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 people uh, I remember yes I remember who it was it was Gaddafi because the this the uh, one of the speeches was um, people were writing uh, Americans were writing uh, follow what mad dog Gaddafi is saying uh, this journalist or this writer is translating or this account is translating what mad dog Gaddafi is saying so this must have been around Zain al-Abidin, the president of Tunisia, around the time that he was kicked out. In, um, in a lot of talks I've, I've seen you, you give, you talk uh, about the importance of social media and how social media played such an important part in revolutions. Um, you've, you've named uh, many people who I think were kind of names are, who are not as popular as they should be. Um, for example, um, Mohamed Bouazizi, uh, uh, from yes. Tunisia, which should be a common name, I think, but it's not. Uh, it's possibly the person who uh, enacted the or sparked the entire Arab Spring, who was a fruit vendor in Tunisia, who had his cart taken away by the local police. And when he couldn't get it back, he set himself alight. He set himself on fire and People were present. He set himself on fire just outside the police station where they had his fruit cart. And people recorded it. People protested. People started to gather. People started sharing this media across the the Arab world. Um, uh, there was people like Khalid uh, Mohammed Saeed in Egypt who was uh, killed by police officers and they tried to cover it up. And... Facebook groups started to form 
And I've heard you talk about how the in in a lot of places where where otherwise people wouldn't be able to one organize a protest and second they can't protest they can't even go out to protest and you've mentioned how they they're able to beforehand thanks to social media tell each other how to dress how to act uh that mm-hmm. in a lot of these places where you can't even uh, be congregated into too many people they say you know have a certain distance between each other when we go out to march and that way we can still respect the law of not uh, coming together as a full protest um so these so a lot of people uh kind of look down a little bit on uh the use of social media and it's uh, partaking of, of revolution but in the arab world it seems to be one of the most essential tools that's very right lalo actually in uh, in some countries social media is almost uh, a luxury almost a way to uh, voice your opinion uh, it's a political tool yes but it but it veers towards the luxury in parts of the arab world it is almost a matter of life and death um, I, the example you gave about egypt when uh, in in 2010 uh, so Egypt and most of the Arab countries operate essentially under martial law, where congregating at more than four people at a time could could be seen as breaking uh, uh, the law and can, co- can cause you to be jailed. So what people did uh, in 2010 was to advise each other to stand four meters apart when you go out in a protest, um, that you don't congregate too closely. And this was their way of uh, trying to bypass the law. And on another example is there are many, many thousands of people in jail across the Arab world. If you think just of Egypt, Lalo, there are over 40,000 uh, individuals in jail in 2016, 2017, according to human rights organizations. Let me tell you that we, as you know, people from the Middle East, only know the names of those who are on social media, of those who had a social media account. So out of the 49,000, we might know several hundred at most, but that means that the vast majority of people who are there are unknown to us. So social media gives you presence in the real life. A virtual account can mean that people in the real world will call and demand justice and demand your freedom. And how how do you see that the use of that social media being used today, so many years after the, the Arab Spring? It has changed completely. So in the early days, of, in the late 2009, 2010, and early Arab Spring, say up to 2012, 13, uh, people were very brave to, 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 to give their opinions. But the, the crackdown has been so harsh by regional governments, almost every government I can think of in the region has jailed uh, activists for an opinion. I cannot make an exception. Maybe Lebanon, although they have jailed one person, but that's almost an exception. But every other country from the Gulf to to Sudan and Egypt and Syria and Jordan and Iraq and and, uh, North Africa, everywhere else, Morocco, they've all jailed people for opinion. Um, What I've noticed is that a lot of people started using groups on social media. So they would they started uh, forming groups on Facebook where only people who are trusted are invited. So I'm a member of some of these groups, but not all of them. Uh, what I've noticed, for example, is that people share their passwords in case they get kidnapped or arrested, uh, that the, and, and the police ask them to access their, their Facebook account. So as soon as the person is uh, disappears, then his friends immediately would go in, or her friends, would immediately go and change their password. And this way, the authorities would not have access to everyone else. It's Again, it's a matter of survival. Um, I've also noticed people have stopped using uh, Facebook and Twitter and have moved first to WhatsApp, and now they've started using Signal, which is the most popular tool for messaging in the region. Why did they move from uh, those platforms to new ones? Well, those platforms have been infested by, by, by spies and by uh, infiltrators, whether they are government, whether they are uh, opponents. Uh, it's, it's become uh, like a minefield. You don't know who to trust and who not to trust. Um, it's no longer the free space for 
people who are uh, liberal, open-minded, uh, leftist, uh, secular, atheist, uh, or uh, Muslim moderates. It's become a place, or Christian moderate, it's become a place where a lot of people who are right-wing, who are, um, you know, uh, government employees, who are uh, essentially uh, there to sabotage the conversation, operate. And so people started moving to to other forms of uh, of social media. Um, I've actually kind of struggled with this myself um, in trying to, you know, uh, start a show and a, and a podcast. It can be very tricky to talk with people from the Middle East um, because so many of the people are anonymous. And then I'm put in a position where, OK, who, who's exactly being honest and who has good intentions there? So one of the rules I, I've put to myself now recently and I've and I've talked uh, about this with uh, other people who have shows where they interview others is to not interview people who are anonymous. But then there's the catch 22 where, well, if I don't interview someone who's anonymous, they, they could be putting themselves at, at risk. But just because uh, the person could be at risk and they are anonymous, I get, again, I, I don't know if they're being honest in who they are. What do you think is possible solutions to help people uh, get their voice out and expand their voices from the Middle East? Well, uh, I can say there are a number of anonymous accounts that, uh, that have a degree of, uh, of credibility. Uh, it, it, is, it, it becomes more difficult, for example, um, let's, with, with Syria, for example, where things are very, very complicated uh, because if there's a, a war, there's some of the anonymous accounts, you're not sure about them. Some of them I trust personally, but uh, they, they're, they're less objective than I would like them to be. But this is a, a fact that they've lost friends, you know, and I don't want to give any of their names, but they have much invested in it. But in Saudi Arabia, for example, there's a number of anonymous accounts that I would, that I would be interested in hearing from. There's an account, for example, that leaks a lot of information from, uh, from the government. And this individual seems to know what's going on, and it's almost frightening. And they say that he's an insider. His account name is Mujtahid, um, which uh, I don't know how to translate it, but it's almost someone who is attempting to perform a deed. Uh, so th that is an, an anonymous account that the Saudi government isn't able to uncover. And uh, there, there, are, there are accounts of people who put their names, but they don't show their faces. Is this anonymous or not? So it's kind of difficult. It's a gray area. I think, Lalo, that social media is so new that we are still sort of the first generation of social media users that the norms haven't been uh, uh, clarified yet. Um, Twitter and Facebook struggle with what to do with anonymous accounts. They usually don't even verify anonymous accounts. Right. What do you think about the the evolution of the use of social media since the Arab Spring that it's not just a tool now for revolutionaries, but extremist groups such as ISIS have become very savvy with their use of social media, using it as a recruiting tool, using it as an outlet to uh, to glorify themselves. So that there seems to be, a, you know, a, a taking advantage of, of social media also from, from the worst groups. Um, also, the, the dictators and um, any kind of totalitarian kind of regimes have also become... More, uh, more accustomed to now not just uh, shutting down the internet, but using it as a propaganda tool. That, that's correct. I, I wrote an article uh, for Project for the 21st Century, an essay that was called "Social Media in the Era of ISIS," where I analyzed this this change, and I and I and I uh, remember coming across um, a sadly impressive usage by these uh, uh, these extremist groups that. Have uh, to, uh, that have employed uh, young uh, social media savvy kids. Uh, sadly, many, many of them from Europe, uh, and they 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 have managed to brainwash them. And these kids are much better at social media than I, and they're much better at uh, at at using technology. And so, for example, when Brazil had the World Cup. And there was a very famous game. I think there was a, a game where Brazil uh, or Germany beat Brazil or vice versa. I can't remember the, the score uh, uh, in, two, in 2014 or so. 
the uh, the, the ISIS and these groups uh, would hijack a hashtag. So, so the hashtag would be World Cup Brazil 2016, whatever it was. They would start putting up their videos and their statements if you click on that hashtag. So they were sabotaging, you know, giant corporations like like Twitter and Facebook. They developed apps where uh, where you could uh, download their news. They had games that uh, that they uh, they you know if you kill someone you get a point and. And, the, and these are probably games developed by these youngsters who are very, very, uh, you know, very media savvy. At the same time, uh, Lalo, and this is something that's very interesting that I noticed, that due to government crackdown, a lot of the secular, liberal, leftist uh, activists who were on, online using Twitter, using Facebook, they had either suspended their accounts, shut down their accounts, Stopped tweeting, stopped posting. These include um, Wa'al Ghanim. These included uh, a lot of popular uh, uh, social media users that were either exiled or thrown in jail or just intimidated. And on the other hand, you had the emergence of these conservative clerics, ultra-conservative clerics, who did, who, who did not even know about social media until after the Arab Spring. So they were never there when I started using social media in 2007, eight, uh, even six. Um, and then you have the, their, follower, their followers or their followings, Lalo, skyrocketed into the millions because you know they have this message, they have the, the backing of, they pretend to have the backing of the, of the state or the backing of the religion uh, behind them. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, the government policies uh, so the shutting down of popular uh, uh, comedy comedians, secular writers, secular uh, uh, bloggers, uh, and they allowed the extremists. And into that world enters ISIS and the other extremists. It was fertile territory for them. So, and it seems to be in an imbalance that those those government officials will kind of leave an open door for those groups and those people uh, using social media, but do extreme crackdowns on the dissidents. Well, yes, on, but they don't, they don't allow the, uh, the religious clerics who condemn them. So these governments would only allow religious clerics who uh, would praise them. And even if they were a little bit bigoted, a little bit racist, a little bit sectarian, they don't mind it so much as long as they don't uh, sort of criticize them, Right. these governments. But if it was a secular person you know, or a, an activist who was, who was demanding rights, then these individuals would be immediately shut down, that there, there, was, no, uh, uh, there was no respite, unlike, unlike some other clerics. And I'm, I'm shocked at what some clerics get away with, because these, these same comments said by liberal uh, activists that the government apparently perceived to be a bigger threat, these would not fly. Um, I also wanted to ask you, since one of the main focus you had during the time that you were tweeting so much of the Arab Spring is simply the the the, the empowerment of minorities, human rights, uh, more secular and open societies. Um, so considering that, you know, years later, it, are you hopeful after the Arab Spring of this? Uh, how do you how do you think that you know the, these kind of movements can continue in this new world to, with, with uh, social media? Has it gotten any better? Well, the, the truth is, Lalo, part of me is very depressed mm -hmm. that this is what happened. Especially when I start reading my notes or my uh, my writings or my articles from those days, uh, seeing the you know seeing the news today is just so depressing. But the reality is that things are even worse. If, if unemployment and economic stagnation and lack of economic opportunities for young people, definitely in, in addition to corruption and graft and government incompetence in the region, all these uh, issues led to the Arab Spring. It wasn't just a call for democracy and the call for human rights. People had problems putting food on the table. People had problems buying medicine and bread for their children and that's, or their families. And that's probably even a bigger reason than it was about freedom of expression. Not everybody who went out in the streets in 2011 
really cared about, I want to be able to write whatever I want and say whatever I want. It was a matter of survival that we cannot even afford uh, to have uh, bread and, and food and medicine and everything is becoming expensive and um, government incompetence, graft, of which there is so much more today. So these governments uh, have to realize that you cannot just put the genie back in the bottle. You can't just, you know, s- s- tighten the lid and say people will, uh, will, uh, will go back and be passive. I think that, uh, you know, go- places like Egypt, for example, places like Sudan, uh, they, if they don't get their act together, things will, uh, uh, will explode uh, once again. There, there, are, there is much more unemployment in Egypt today. There is zero tourism. There is very little investment. Uh, hotels are empty. Uh, all these historical sites are empty. So the, the reasons for the Arab Spring are still there, and they're even bigger. So unfortunately, we are looking at a scenario where this thing is repeated. Do you think there'll be another Arab Spring? I think it will be manifested in different ways, to be honest with you. Uh, the, when the Arab Spring as a uh, peaceful movement failed, some people became extremists. When, uh, when, um, if it continues to fail and, and, the, and the governments continue to, to uh, deny people basic rights from freedom of expression, human rights, freedom of uh, religion, uh, the, uh, and in addition to, to economic uh, uh, and uh, social uh, rights that they, ha- that they don't have, it will manifest itself in one way or the other. It could be terrorism. It could be extremism. It could be something that we don't know yet. It could be that the military uh, starts acting. It could be, um, you know, uh, a scenario that we are, it could be a, 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 a neighboring country getting involved because they feel that, there is a threat, and we've seen neighboring countries getting involved in in many in many states where the where the government has failed. These neighboring countries have interfered, and I think this is a scenario that might uh, reemerge. Yeah, I, I want to ask you about when you say um, get their act together. So, for example, on social media, I'm I'm very critical of religion. Um, religion in general, but often especially about Islam. And I'm under no delusions that my my, uh, my criticism might be a little bit too atheist-based for most people <laughs> because I, mm. I, I, uh, I was, I'm born an atheist. My parents are atheists. I, have, I don't really have a religious background. So I, I know I'm not everyone's taste. And on, on top of that, I'm also very aware of the fact that you can't just make the Middle East atheist one day to the next and all problems are solved it, that's not about that and also on, on top of that i it's my criticism of is in no way ever you know any way implying that i want censorship of religion right I, I don't i don't think the u.s or any western country improves the condition of religiosity or the the well-being of people by censoring religious books closing down places of worship like mosques um Anything that where they're not hurting anyone, the, the free practice should always be there. Um, however, I think, and and here's, I also want to ask you if, if you agree with this, I think a lot of the problems that, it, that uh, impede human rights, freedom of expression, women's rights, are often, not always, but often, and probably in the majority in a lot of these countries, based in religion. And how exactly do you push back uh, against that? So when you say um, they get their act together, like what what would you see that being? So uh, let's put a qualifier here. Uh, first of all, I agree with you. I think religion is uh, being misused. I think religion is being uh, manipulated for uh, whoever wants to to ha- to attain power or wants to uh, control others. Um, I also see that religion is used not only uh, in Islam, but also Christianity in the, in the Middle East and the Arab world. Uh, they, they, they are both being used by uh, those in power or those who want to uh, influence uh, uh, certain individuals. I, uh, when I say the, the government needs to get the, their act together, first of all, they have to ban and jail not only uh, uh, people who commit crimes, but people who incite uh, others, people who, uh, uh, these clerics who encourage others to commit crimes, even if they say we, even if they don't commit crimes themselves, 
But the fact that they encourage others to do it and, and they use the, uh, the, uh, the uh, sort of the umbrella of religion and say, you will go to heaven if you commit this crime. These are people who are responsible because they're sending teenagers and people in their early 20s to, 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 to kill others. And, they're, and they, so they cannot be uh, looked upon as uh, innocent bystanders. Um, on a personal uh, level, Lalo, I believe that uh, reform of Islam and to a degree Christianity, but reform of Islam, especially uh, in the in the Middle East and the Arab world, especially in the Arab world, has to uh, uh, has to happen. It is it is essential that it happens, uh, but I believe that it will not come from the Arab world. I believe that the reform of Islam will come from. Uh, mosques in the in the east and the west. So you're looking at mosques of Indonesia. You're looking at mosques of uh, of uh, the U.S. where you have uh, women imams, where you have uh, gay members uh, of the community who are accepted, where you have um, you know uh, where human rights are being uh, where 21st century concepts of human rights are acknowledged. I believe personally that the reformation of Islam will come from the West and from the East, not from the Arab world. There are a lot of great you know, clerics here who are open-minded and they, co- and they speak about, uh, about uh, uh, you know, anti-sectarian rhetoric. Um, uh, I like and I respect these individuals, but I don't think they go far enough. I don't think the system allows them to go far enough. And to be honest with you, uh, I feel that uh, there, there is a, there's a strong chance that the reformation of Islam will come from one of the uh, mosques from outside the region. So I kind of want to put, contra- not contradict, but maybe d- debate you on two points you made there, one in the Middle East and the other one in the West. When you said that they should just ban or put in jail the 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 people who incite violence, it, although that, I mean, I wouldn't, in, in theory, or ethically have a problem with, with, with that because, I mean, they're deplorable people. However, what I worry about is that by jailing those people, you turn them into martyrs. And I've seen so much in, in reading about the politics and revolutions that uh, in the Middle East. And when, we, when you talk about revolutions in the Middle East, often they're not, they're not good. People tend to think revolution good, but sometimes revolutions can be the revolution of the fundamentalists. So the, let's say the most extreme groups of people in a, in a country, when their leader who's inciting vi- violence is put in jail, now they feel victimized. They feel more empowered. They, they feel that that person has become a martyr to them. They feel like they have to be more extreme because now they're being hunted down. So how do you balance that out where you want to not have these people be the only voices uh, being heard and not inciting violence, but also not having them transform into into victims and martyrs for for the most extremist groups to to empower themselves and become uh, more violent. So you have to begin from the beginning. You begin from a curriculum that does not incite against uh, non-Muslims, non-Sunni, non-Shia, whatever it is that your curriculum incites against. That you have to go to the root of the problem. Uh, then you have to ban the financiers of the of the uh, of the incitement and the the terror. Uh, people who are raising money and sending money to these to these uh, uh, extremist organizations, you stop their bank accounts. They, they you you basically clip their wings. They are they are unable to carry out so easily their their acts of uh, of uh, incitement. Uh, if someone uses social media to 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 spread hatred, easy ban this person from using social media. Now, there I understand. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm a big proponent of human rights. And I understand that this can be misused. And, for example, uh, someone like me who celebrated the, the, the fall of dictatorships, you know, in, in the Arab Spring, it could look like I am, uh, uh, you know, inciting against uh, a reg- the regime of friendly countries. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a yeah. thin line. So, so, but, but, but it's a double edged sword that could work against you. you know? It's a double edged sword. I completely acknowledge that. But I am, uh, I feel, and I do not want to go overboard. I don't want to overreach like some other people uh, want to do so. But I believe that we are at such a critical juncture that we need, we need to, um, we need to uh, 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 stop the 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 uh, the, uh, the incitement. We need to stop 
the possibilities that that social media or the banking system allows to, for people who want to commit violence. I will tell you about uh, an individual here uh, who, whom, I, whom I know who, who was in jail in, uh, in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Who came out to be a, uh, who became, he came out to be a very secular and um, enlightened thinker. His his name is uh, Mansour Al Nugaidan, and I had the privilege really to to meet this person. Now this person acknowledges that he was uh, sort of an extremist, almost jihadist in his in his youth, and then he came out. He said, "I realized what I did wrong," and he started writing about this thing you know, uh, uh, basically condemning these acts that he was part of, essentially. Now, the government sent him to visit a, uh, to visit a number of people he was, he, he was associated with in jail and maybe talk to them, try to, make, try to talk some sentence, sense into them. And they told him, he told me the story, they told him the first thing we will do when we come out of jail is go and find you. You know, and, uh, but not in a nice way. They, they were really threatening him uh, uh, so, to be honest with you, um, th there are people whose jobs is to deal psychologically with these individuals. There are there are reasons why these people have turned this way. They have been incited. Uh, the curriculums in the schools, uh, Lalo, the uh, the the preachers, the 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 clerics, who tell you that gay people should be killed, who tell you that. Um, you know, women have no rights, who tell you that other sects of Islam, for God's sake, other Muslims are not, are not either worthy or not Muslim enough or whatever it is. It is, uh, it is something that we can no longer afford. Um, we have to stop this from happening uh, and we have to teach tolerance, we have to teach uh, acceptance, we have to uh, emphasize the good parts of Islam because as you said, uh, there's, you, you cannot wish Islam away from this region. You cannot say, well, you know, maybe in 20 years it'll disappear. So the, the, the idea is how do you, you know, uh, salvage the best? How do you emphasize the best and try and eliminate the, the, the bad uh, understanding of Islam? But in that case where, where you're talking about, so a lot of these are empowered by, by the government, or at least the government doesn't interfere what they do. Um, but then a lot of these governments are themselves very totalitarian and don't um, allow too many freedoms in their country. So when you give them that sword to come down on the clerics or those who speak most, most extreme, those who incite violence, you're essentially giving a sword to another form of of extremism and another form of totalitarianism. And like you said, it, it could come down on you as well. Cause now it's like, well, they, they are coming down on the extremists who's inciting violence, but now it's like, well, I, uh, what happens with the person who has issues with the government and the government can come to them and say, Oh wait, you're inciting violence and, and uh, unrest among the people and against the government, which could lead to death and people. So they can use the same law against them. So the, you know, the, the power shifts from one group to another, but how do you, how do you keep it balanced where, you know, you're still getting human rights? I, I'll tell you how you do this civil society, civil society, which is missing from most of the Arab states uh, is really the, the checks and balance is the uh, is is the tool that that uh, that would stop the government from overreach and protect the the citizen uh, if the government does so. But civil society has been smothered in the Arab world. Uh, civil society is a byword for for uh, for for opposition. Civil society automatically means an opponent of the government according to the government understanding. It need not be this way. The, uh, Which there governments are, there do, are you, uh, do you mean when you, when you say that? Let me say that most of the Arab world uh, doesn't allow civil society movements. I can give you the exceptions. The exceptions is that in Lebanon, there is civil society. In Jordan, there is some civil society. In Morocco, there is some civil society. The only countries that have true free civil societies in the Arab world are Tunisia and Lebanon. The, the rest, they do not have. Uh, free civil society. Kuwait has a little bit. Uh, uh, Iraq, to a degree, has, but you know they're almost ineffective. So Lebanon, Tunisia are the only places where you see 
um, a, a civil society that protects. In Tunisia, we saw uh, civil society that moved to, to protect a, a gay uh, writer or activist, for example. So this is a country that had an Islamist government. And civil society is the uh, was the uh, was the force that pushed back against uh, against intimidation of this this activist. Um, so that was I mean for me it was a, that was a manifestation of the power of civil society, and and many other places. So wh- I think that uh, if the governments uh, and you have to you know believe that these governments think responsibly, these governments need to allow an independent civil society sphere. And that is where you get your checks and balances. That's where you get uh, uh, control uh, uh, against overreach by the government. So I want to push back on, on, a, on the second thing you said about the West, which is, I mean, in theory, it, it sounds good because you'll have a lot more liberal and secular thinking Muslims outside the, the Arab world in the United States or maybe Australia or some in Europe. But I, I see a, a problem that is kind of being reinforced by the Western governments themselves. And that is, um, I, I want to kind of offer you a term that I've thought up for, for a certain group of people. And that's uh, the uh, macchiato Muslims. And mm-hmm. I, I, I took this off from um, the latte liberals. Interesting. Which is used for, for example, if you followed the the death of um, Fidel Castro, you saw a lot of people in the West who who live with all the the advancement and all the the benefits of of technology of technology and, and, and capitalism yeah. and all that, but they ideologically agree with socialism and or at least extreme forms of socialism and communism, and therefore they use their benefits and their commodity of being in a free democratic capitalist society and they'll tweet from their iphone and all that and their their uh, their their macbooks and you know and drink their lattes hence the latte liberal and talk about socialism and communism as if they're great things having never actually been in there but they'll go as so far to defend the ideology by defending the countries that practice that ideology like Cuba and like Fidel Castro. And so I see a similarity now with a lot of Muslims in the West who I call the macchiato Muslims uh, because they their priority is not to defend people who are suffering in the Middle East. It's to defend the ideology and their own situation. So in their own situation in the West, their their priority is the anti-Muslim bigotry of, let's say, the United States and what Trump is saying, etc. And they feel that any criticism that is made of Islam could feed into what they see as the narrative of the right wing. You know, you'll get people like I've seen um, a, a writer of Palestinian background in the U.S. like uh, Linda Sarsour saying, Sharia in in uh, Saudi Arabia is great because you get free health care, right? Or you'll get uh, Reza Aslan on CNN saying there is 100% perfect equality between men and women in uh, Indonesia. So there's this kind of, uh, again, <laughs> catch, a catch-22 in where you do have a lot of progressive and liberal Muslims, but they're not the ones being voiced. They're not the ones being funded by the Middle East. Though they're not the ones being endorsed by the Western governments. They're in a different situation, right? They, they, they care about their personal situation. So what do you see as a, a solution to that if those are the best voices to, to create reform, but they seem to be the le- least endorsed people? So I would say, uh, you know, the... the, 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 the the, the government or official approval of individuals uh, is not only not necessary, but sometimes it's completely wrong. Remember, the U.S. invited and uh, the Taliban uh, the, and the Reagan, the Taliban, to the White House and praised them as freedom fighters against the Russians. And they remember, they invited Anwar al-Awlaqi to, to, to the White House uh, before he went to Yemen and they, they, they killed him. So... We shouldn't always look at the who, who the U.S. government or who the official uh, uh, organization sort of endorse. Um, I, I uh, and nor should we look at who the Middle Eastern governments endorse, because as you said, and that was a very good point, that they would endorse people who would uh, praise them, or people who would, you know they want a visa because they want to go to Mecca, or you know they want some kind of financial support. But but there are many many Muslims that 
I unfortunately I am not in tune with the the small mosques in America or the uh, the mosques where uh, you know women women lead the prayers. Uh, I, I can't imagine this uh, this female imam, uh, this female Muslim uh, religious leader being invited to Saudi Arabia on an official status. Do, do you know what I mean? Because she goes against the teachings there. Yeah. So I would I would look at some. I wouldn't imagine that a gay imam would be invited or a gay Muslim would be invited officially in an official capacity to any country in the Arab world. You know, I couldn't imagine that. But maybe that's the kind of people we should keep an eye on, that these individuals, they're so brave to, 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 to do what they're doing. And these are the people that we should keep an eye on. And I, I don't want to dismiss the regular people because regular people, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, there's a lot of Muslims who speak out against um, against some of the actions of Middle Eastern government. Uh, and you know, some, of the, some of the people that you might have noticed, uh, they don't really represent uh, everyday Muslims in, uh, in America. So uh, I, I have a little bit of hope, and I think we need to have hope. Uh, I, I certainly can't see um, reform coming from the region. It's very difficult. I, re- I, I follow that the United Arab Emirates, the country I'm coming from, is, seems to be backing a lot of Sufi Islam uh, scholars. And Sufis, uh, Sufi Islam is sort of a kind of benign, very spiritual Islam. It's almost like Kabbalah for Jews. Um, it's, 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 it, there's a lot of uh, spirituality within it. And the UAE seems to be backing that uh, strand of uh, of Islam, which is very tolerant. That's a good sign. But how tolerant is tolerant? My my measure of tolerance is very very uh, high. So I need I need them to accept, uh, you know, uh, things that they might not be ready to accept. And uh, and and so, you know, I'm hopeful. It's a good first step. But I think we're still many decades away. I th- I agree that your I think your your level of tolerance might be extremely high <laughs> considering for in comparison like I, in the the national I saw one of your articles that was titled mixed marriages bring strength to the UAE mm-hmm. which where you were in, endorsing that the country only benefits from being more multicultural more multiracial mm-hmm. and more mm-hmm. tolerant to people who are uh, either in mixed marriages or who gain citizenship and from a different country and things like that, which I, I don't know how well it sits with others. And then you also have written an article in Al Monitor, which was the uh, Gulf atheism in the age of so, uh, social media, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. which was a lot about many writers fr- from uh, Ar- Arab states who uh, either themselves atheists or or uh, being very harsh critics uh, of Islam. So I'm not sure how a lot of this sits. How are you seen in 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 the in in the Middle East or in the UAE and things like that? Do you, do you do you get a lot of back like positive responses? Do you get a lot of? Uh, well, I imagine you get a lot of criticism. Well, I I'm very happy to get a lot of criticism. I'm I'm actually I think if I don't get criticisms, that means that I'm doing a bad job. That means I'm not being read. That means I'm not stirring the the the, the pot. Uh, it means I'm not doing uh, what I should be doing, which is to present new ideas and, and to push the envelope as much as I can without getting into too much trouble. But uh, am, I, uh, am I a representative sample? I think not. I think I am within the minority of the minorities. Um, in, in one of, I'll give you an interesting example. In, in one of the articles where I, closed, where I called for uh, naturalization uh, or giving citizenship to a lot of the people in the Gulf and in the UAE uh, where we do not have a process, we don't have a process. You could live here for 50 years and not be a citizen. Um, so I said we need to nationalize some people. I said some people. We have to have a process, whether whether the process means that they have to live here for a specific period of time, have a certain background, um, are you know uh, are educated or not. It's not really uh, uh, something I was tackling then. But then the, the uh, that article caused so much stir that I think there was a dozen or so uh, articles published in the newspaper uh, referring to my article as suspicious, having been written in English. I was trying to um, appeal to uh, to uh, Amnesty International, who were then visiting the UAE that week, which I had no idea, by the way, that they were visiting. 
but um, because I don't keep their schedule. <laughs> right. But uh, uh, but uh, but there was a hashtag created on Twitter in Arabic that said this writer does not represent me. So um, it was a very difficult time, and Reuters wrote about it. Uh, I can send you the article. But uh, a few months later, I met a government official who uh, who, who told me, Sultan, uh, I agree with your point, and I, I think we should start looking at. Uh, nationalizing uh, uh, some people. So uh, it's interesting that a lot of the sort of the local nationalist right-wing elite here thought that the government would be against my idea when the government really was considering what I, what I wrote about. Um, so, uh, the, you know, it's, uh, I'm really hopeful, but to be honest with you, Lalo, uh, people don't like to come out on the record and say, I agree with Sultan. They tell me, Sultan, privately, we agree with you, by the way. You know, I think your point is very important. I think we have to do this. We agree with you. But they never come out to agree with me in public. And, uh, you know, but, but this is how movements start. You start by presenting an idea and you keep pushing for the idea. And you hope if the idea is good enough that somebody will, 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 uh, will pick it up and, and, and carry it through. I, you know, in my conversations with a lot of critics, and sometimes these are even, you know, they're not they're not people from the Middle East. They're not Muslim themselves. Uh, sometimes they're not very even religious themselves. But they often tell me that uh, critics of religion in the West, uh, especially if they're atheist writers with no, you know, kind of Arab or Muslim background, they said they are just um, preaching to the choir that in the Middle East, no one is paying attention to them. And I've been very suspicious about that as far as its validity. Um, it, do you see that 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 uh, criticism from the West, like you were talking about with liberal um, Muslims also being uh, probably the best chance for reformers? Do you also think p uh, people in general uh, offering criticisms of religion in places where it has to be behind closed doors and has to be very quiet? Uh, do you think... They they can reach the people there as well, considering that maybe there, you know there's language barriers and and uh, you know problems with access to internet. But is there is there some kind of connection there? Um, so uh, I, yes, I agree with you that there is an element of elitism, but I have found uh, the acceptance of uh, either extreme secular ideas or even atheism as uh, a, a very, very common uh, in, in the circles. I've visit, visited almost every country in the region, and it might be the case that I mix with crowds of people who agree with me, but, uh, but even in the mixed crowds, I see people who say, uh, who seem to be tolerant of the idea, uh, who seem to be uh, accepting of the idea that you can't force someone to be religious. You can't beat people up. And it, there seems to be a um, what's the word when you when it's a reverse uh, an inverse relationship um, when 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 people even those who are a bit more conservative see ISIS throwing gays from over buildings and beating people up to pray and forcing them to grow beards even people who are traditionally conservative or traditional in the in the region when they see these things this distances them from religion this makes them uh, question the tenets this makes them question the ideas, and if not, at least question the application of religion. So, uh, so this was an interesting phenomenon that I've, that I've noticed. When you say application of religion, what are you referring to there? I'm, I'm referring to people believe that uh, you should fast. Uh, people believe that Islam calls on you to fast, but doesn't believe that you should be punished if you don't. It should be a personal choice, for example. Well, um, I also wanted to talk with you about um, your fascination in art, and I, I think this is great. the the subject of art is greatly ignored in the West, how they see Middle Eastern artists, because this seems to be one of the best options of people being able to express their opinion in a very subtle, uh, under the table way without being too direct. I saw a lot of your videos, and you have a you know fascination with art, and you. you you have a collection that you put on on exhibit in, in many places, and I want to know how how do you see the the influence of politics through art? So uh, so art has uh, always been, and not just in the Arab world but across the world, a, a vehicle to express 
uh, opinions uh, by by a certain group of people. So you so if uh, if you are interested in politics, for example, or in social issues, you could do that through an article, through a poem, through a song, through protesting in the street, but also through an artwork. So uh, we have seen this uh, uh, w- with Picasso's Guernica. We have seen this with. Uh, with uh, um, um, M.F. Hussein in India painting uh, Mother India, for instance. So we have seen artists in the West and the East uh, use this tool as a, as a tool of expression. And artists in the Arab world have done the same. So in the 1920s, uh, 30s, 40s, we've seen uh, artists who uh, formed uh, groups in Egypt called the Art and Liberty Group and Art and Freedom Group who have uh, demonstrated against the rise of uh, Nazism and, uh, uh, and the, the European uh, ultra-socialism that they had in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Germany, in uh, Italy, in Spain, and elsewhere. So uh, these artists have been very active since then. Uh, these artists have, uh, uh, have called for uh, uh, reform, have called for uh, po- political change, have been very active against the colonial presence in, in countries across the region, whether it was France or Britain, for instance. Um, they, have, uh, they have went out on street protests. They have been jailed. They have been punished. And even today, artists, you know, 80, 90 years after, uh, continue to be uh, uh, victims of government repression. There are artists who are unable to exhibit. There are artists who cannot uh, appear on television and, or have exhibitions held. Uh, artists in exile, artists who aren't uh, galleries that have been shut down across the region, artworks that have been taken down. So artists in the Arab world have really been victims and, and at least major players, I believe, in the political movement and uh, unfortunately they have been neglected and and uh, and but i not only exhibit political art although that's really my fascination and what i'm interested in but the, but my my fascination in 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 art from the arab world is to present a different narrative about the region so when we held an exhibition in Tehran that just ended a few days ago it ended in the end of 2016 so we had 20,000 visitors for an exhibition that went over seven weeks, Lalo. I was, um, I was very, uh, uh, um, I, I purposely asked our curator to take artworks uh, from the collection of, uh, uh, of Arabs or people who lived in Arab states, who spoke Arabic, who carried Arabic passports, even though they are not ethnically Arab, uh, but in order to show the diversity of the Arab world, we took Christian uh, artists, uh, we took Christian Arab, Armenian Arab, Jewish Arab, uh, you know, uh, African Arab, uh, Berber, Amazigh Arab, uh, Kurdish Arab artists to Iran. And I wanted to show the diversity of the Arab world. Uh, and it is not only a reminder to the outside world, Lalo, but it's even when we do exhibitions inside the Arab world, I, you know, we exhibit a work and we say, Ezekiel Baruch was a Jewish Egyptian uh, artist, for example. Uh, Mayo was a Greek uh, Egyptian. Uh, Paul Gergosian was an Armenian Lebanese. So the, the whole idea is to present a different narrative. We are not uh, either Sunni or Shia only, but we are also uh, a collection of dozens of other ethnicities that are reflected in the uh, arts community. So I also wanted to ask you about how you feel about social media currently. My perception personally of how I see followers is about 90% of my followers on uh, Twitter are anonymous, while about just 10% of my followers on on Facebook are anonymous. And I think this makes a huge difference. So I myself have been kind of moving a little bit to to Facebook, and I'm wondering, uh, do you feel still encouraged to use social media? Well, do you still feel encouraged to use it as you have in, in the past to kind of be an outlet of, of information and translation of what's going on in the Arab region? So I'm very grateful to social media. I'm very grateful to Twitter and Facebook. I made a lot of friends. I wouldn't be speaking to you had it not been social media. I wouldn't have uh, met uh, a lot of people that I consider to be, you know, the closest friends. So I want to just put that out there first. But 
social media is no longer the free space where I can offer uh, ideas and debate uh, freely. It, it became a place where people voice their anger. It became a place where a, uh, you know, uh, where debating uh, became a, an exercise of, uh, you know, tension and, uh, and anger and frustration. And, and so I feel like when I think of social media, I like to think of the first few years that social media emerged. And uh, Twitter, for, for instance, uh, and even Facebook to a degree, has been a victim of its own success. Uh, the more people so, uh, signed up, the less they could control this environment. And so the less that many of the users who signed up in the early days uh, are using it. This is something that I have noticed uh, myself. Um, do I continue to use it? No. But will I be ready to use it if the Arab Spring happens again? Uh, I, I most definitely will. I hope someone else will do a better job than I did. But I would be more than happy to, to either translate or to, to play a part. Maybe it's not translation. Maybe it is uh, assisting other people through, uh, through guiding them or something. That, that I might have a different kind of role, but I will never abandon my region. And if social media is the only way I can support people here and support their aspirations, I definitely will do that. Um, and, and the last thing I want to say is I'm trying to take some time back for myself. So I'm, I'm turning 40 next year, 2018. And I, I feel like I gave social media my entire 30s, uh, the last decade or so. And I'd like to have, I'd like to claim back my 40s. I want to go back to reading. <laughs> I, I swear, I, I want to go back to reading. I want to go back to just, um, re, you know, reading texts reading yeah. books and not reading 140 uh, character uh, tweets. Yeah, definitely. And I, that's a, that's good advice. And I, and I, and I've already given it uh, two years and I should be careful not to give it a full decade of my, my life. Um, well, th and thank you so much, uh, Sultan. Again, I've been talking with uh, Sultan Sud Al Qasimi. Um, he's on Twitter as at Sultan uh, Al Qasimi, which is S U L T A N A L Q A S S E M I. So, uh, is there anything else you wanted to uh, in endorse or talk about? Uh, I think the shows that, you, like I said at the beginning, that you were going to have. Well, I'm uh, first of all, I'm very grateful for being on your podcast. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of your country, uh, of Chile. I'm a fan of South America. Uh, because of uh, how they moved away largely from dictatorships in the 70s and 80s, and they've, they, they've, they've become free market economies, how they've lifted the borders, how they've empowered the, the individual. Uh, even when, when leaders have come to be seen as corrupt, they've been able to replace them, but the country did not collapse uh, into, into uh, chaos. And so I have a lot of respect for your part of the world, and I hope one day... We can be uh, as good. I know it's not perfect. I know there's a lot of uh, things that need to be improved. But for me, it's a great leap forward for us in the Arab world to be like uh, South and Latin American countries. Uh, with regards to exhibitions, we have three exhibitions coming up this year in the U.S. We have a show in Paris. We have a show in Jordan. And we are, uh, maybe I shouldn't be telling you this, but we are in negotiations with a museum in Mexico to have a show there in 2018. And so I'm looking forward to uh, to doing more work with South America, with Latin America and South America. And if people want details on this, uh, is there a specific website that they can see it all on? Yes, so they can go to uh, barjeel.com, which is B-A-R-J-E-E-L dot uh, com, dot, which is, uh, it is, it is the foundation uh, that uh, that I started uh, where they can get information on, on, uh, on previous and upcoming shows. Okay. And if anybody doesn't want to write it all out, I will have links in the description. And thank you again, Sultan, for being on. Thank you, Lara. It's a pleasure.